I'm uh, an environmentalist who really did by accident, actually. Um, it was just after the uh, publication of Laudato Si that the uh, <coughs> General Secretary of the Bishops' Conference wrote to me and said, well, you better be the spokesman for the environment for the Bishops' Conference. I said, what? Well, this work, if you are a trustee of CAFOD, and uh, that would seem to be the most appropriate thing since CAFOD has done some very serious environmental work. So I said, well, is there no one else? <laughs> because it looks like a fairly complicated field to me and uh, rather demanding. And they said, no, there is nobody else. So I have that role and I'm very pleased in, in a way to be able to do some. It is an enormous role. I could do it full time, frankly. Um, and after what Paul said in the last hour to us, um, I feel that the, the, the immensity of the problem is something that we cannot escape. Um, when David Attenborough says we are facing um, catastrophic global problems, uh, then he doesn't sensationalise, he doesn't use language which he can't substantiate. Uh, we, we have some very serious problems, and, and travelling with CAFOD, I've seen some of the effects on some of the poorest people in the world. I've stood in a village in Niger on the edge of the Sahara where the people were saying we might be able to stay here one more year but since we can no longer grow anything we simply have to move on. Uh, I stood with a farmer in Bangladesh and he was up to his knees in water, seawater, saying this was my farm two years ago. It has nothing to farm at all. And I stood too in, in parts of Africa, particularly during the drought in the Horn of Africa, uh, to just see the devastation of crops not being able to grow, nothing being able to survive. Anyway, I'm here apparently to talk about, oh, it's not there, theological implications, is that right? I think. I'm not a theologian, sorry about that. Um, I, I passed the exams, I did my best. Um, but, uh, I've never really thought of myself as speaking in depth about theology. Um, the thing, the best way I can approach what I want to say this morning is to simply say, where is God in all this? And to ask where we might make steps in the right direction. Because I'm fairly clear in my my own personal theology, that the road ahead is never very clear. We take it step by step. So, if we were to go to the Synoptic Gospels, they agree on so many things, but they particularly record an incident, which I think should be a foundation for us. Matthew, Mark and Luke all talk about a moment when a Pharisee comes to address Jesus. Now, was he a Pharisee looking for trouble, trying to wind Jesus up, trying to knock him down, get a good argument going? Or was he a Pharisee who was genuinely interested in what Jesus had to say? But he came up and he asks Jesus, what is the most important commandment of the law? And Jesus says, in more or less word for word in all three synoptics, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And the second most important commandment closely related to it is you must love your neighbour as yourself. And I think that has to be a foundation stone that we take with us wherever we are as Christians. We must love our neighbour as ourselves. Because thinking about it, how do we love God? It's quite difficult, isn't it? I mean, we can pray to God, we can adore God, we can say thanks to God. We can fast because we think it's a good way of showing our fidelity to God. Um, but in our actions, it's very difficult to act in a way that loves God, which doesn't affect other people. Our way of loving God is reflected in the way we love the people around us. And that's something that we've got to be much clearer about, much more aware of. And that's something that I think Pope Francis has been intent on teaching us. He has told us time and time again that everything is connected. If you look at his four encyclicals, they're all, none of them are about an issue. He can't see a single issue. When he wrote Evangelii Gaudium, he was intent on telling us that we are all missionary disciples. 
that whatever we do has an effect on other people and we have duties in which we are able to touch other people's lives. And he talks about going to the peripheries. He was uh, only Pope for about three months when he went to Rio de Janeiro for World Youth Day. And whilst he was there, he met with the South American bishops. He can be pretty direct when he's talking to bishops and priests, as he should be, because we've got responsibilities and we must be sure about what we're doing and he must correct us if we're going wrong. And he said to these bishops something like, it's no good you lot sitting in your cathedrals with the doors open, waiting for people to come in. Do you have the courage to go out there and to walk with people even while they're still walking away from the church? That's quite a dimension of pastoral work that can easily be ignored. One of the most important moments in my liturgical year is the first Sunday of Lent, when we have the right of election. When people come to the cathedral in quite large numbers and say, we're planning on being received into the church. It's wonderful encouragement to me. I love it. And you see people of all different types of traditions and cultures, ages and experience, they actually want to join our church. How amazing is that in our secular world? So that's a great moment for me, but that's not enough. We've got to go out there and to walk with people, even while they're still walking away from the church. And we know who they are, don't we? They're members of our families, they're among our friends, our work colleagues. People who probably haven't made any specific decision, I'm not bothered with faith anymore. They've just been drawn away, lured away by secularism, consumerism, materialism, the comforts of life. But the strange thing is, they're chasing after these things and they're not making them happy. Our world, our society is groaning with all sorts of social problems we didn't have before. Go into a school these days and you will find people there on the staff looking after children coming from disturbed families. Problems that simply didn't exist as most of us were growing up. I was in a primary school the other day in Manchester and the head teacher said over 50% of the pupils in this school come from families where there are drug and alcohol and mental issues. Shocking. So we're not creating a better world, although we're being drawn away. So a lot of people are being drawn away and we've got to walk with them. And Pope Francis used that wonderful passage from Luke's Gospel after the resurrection when the two disciples are walking away from Jerusalem. And they must have been thinking, well, it's, it's finished, isn't it? We've, you know, we saw him crucified. What do we do now? It's all over. And they were walking away. Who walks with them? He doesn't say stop there whilst I convince you. He walks with them for the whole day, telling them that actually this was all part of the plan. I told the disciples more than once that I would suffer, die, and rise again. Don't worry about it. And they make a chance of it. But that's because Jesus had the patience to walk with those who were walking away from the church. So we've got to recognize that things don't just sort of happen in an open and shut way. We've, we've got our work to do. But Pope Francis tells us in Evangelii Gaudium that we're all missionary disciples, that we can't look in on our parishes. It's great to make sure that our parishes are good and healthy communities. We've got to be there. We've got to make our prayer, our liturgy good and worthwhile. We've got to celebrate our sacraments. We've got to make sure that our young people, as best we can, are being engaged in the church and learning the faith. We've got to make sure that the elderly and the housebound aren't being rejected, but they are still associated with the parish community. That's great. This is not small enough. We've got to be looking out. We've got to have that missionary purpose going out to the peripheries. Now, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Salford Diocese has gone through a long consultation uh, because we've got a lot of restructuring to do. We were swamped with priests in the past, can't tell you. Swamped. Very good, loving priests. But they were coming in droves from Ireland and 
We were setting up a church according to the number of priests we got and building churches for all of them. And that's all changed now. And we're having to restructure a lot of parishes, amalgamating churches, even closing some. And there are disappointing letters that come to me saying, you can't close this church. I was baptised here, I got married here. I don't actually go there now, but you, you cannot, it's too important to our community. Or other letters that say, I'm sorry, the 6.30 Mass on Saturday evening is a must. We need it. We always want to it. You can't change it. And I have to write back and say, well, who's going to celebrate it? We've got to rethink the way we structure our communities, and we can't just be looking in on the way that we do things. So that sense of mission has to touch every aspect of what we're doing. Then Pope Francis wrote Laudato Si, and it was greatly anticipated the Pope's going to say something about the environment. But it wasn't just about the environment. It was about resources, about people, about creatures, about our planet, about how we build our cities, how we treat people, how we make sure we draw in and include people, that we go out to the peripheries to make sure that no one's marginalized and lost. It can't just be about the environment, because all that is about the environment. And then we move on to Amoris Laetitia, the joy of love, and those Skeptics and the academic conservative types say, oh, it's all about that business of divorce and remarriage and communion. And no, that was one tiny bit. It was about relationships and the fact that we get in, in our individual lives into numbers of relationships of different types throughout our life. And each relationship has its purpose and its level and it has to be fed and nourished and we draw from it the very great benefits. We can't just single out the marriage relationship or the parent-child relationship or the, the elderly relationship dependent on those who care for they're all mixed together nothing is in isolation when he's rounded it off with gaudete et exultate which is all about that personal spirituality that feeds all those things and understands that everything is connected but that's what we've got to be so aware of when we're discussing matters on the environment. Everything is connected. The actions that we do today, the way that we got here, the food that we're going to eat and hopefully not throw away or waste, the clothes that we're wearing, so many things that we've done, the decisions that we make every day have implications right across the board and they affect people. And they affect disproportionately the people who have done the least to cause the damage. So we've got to be aware of this. Now, in many places, I think awareness is growing. Earlier this year, I wrote a pastoral letter. We should do that sort of thing. I knew most of the parish priests sit back and say, oh, we don't have to preach this Sunday, that's great. <laughs> but I thought, I'm going to write on the environment. And then I thought, well, if I write to the parishes, yes, I'm getting some people, but we've got 208 schools in Salford Diocese, and I think I'll write to them as well. So having got the initial pastoral letter, I got some teachers to put it into that school-type language that I hope the young people would understand better. And I have to say, it went down a treat. Because in the schools, They've taken the whole business really very seriously. It's wonderful to see it. I've been in five schools this week, and every one of them were telling me about their various projects, whether it's to do with water um, conservation, or uh, uh, woodlands, or um, <coughs> the, the growing of things, or uh, the recycling of waste, or the use of plastics and eco-bricks. I was in... Uh, a primary school up in the north of the diocese, it's only one form entry, so only 120 pupils. And they got very serious in the last year about this. And through these 120 pupils and their families and engagement with the local community, they have collected 3,000 eco bricks. Not bad. Do you know how much plastic goes into one eco brick? It's extraordinary. You can go on stuffing it, it just will not fill up. 3,000 eco bricks, and they built an outdoor classroom of these plastic eco bricks. And whilst I was there, a seven year old 
took me by the hand and took me across to a built-up garden, built up by eco bricks. And he said, well, the sage is there and the mint's there and the beetroot's down here. We've got onions here because that's a better water flow and they need that. I thought, this, this child, but um, there were other children standing around commenting to make sure he got it right. <laughs> and they were so engaged with every question on the environment. And so I went to the head teacher and I said, well, this, this is wonderful, but surely you've got the syllabus to teach and you've got sats and all the rest. He said, fine. We, we read about the environment, we write about the environment, we count things according to the environment, and because the children are so engaged in the environment, our levels of literacy are going up significantly because they're really enjoying what they're doing. I was so impressed by these young people. They seem to have got the idea in their heads that this is a moment when they've got to take responsibility. It's a start. We've got to make sure, though, that it's not just our schools, isn't it? We've got to make sure that our governments take notice, and we've got that zero emissions statement from the present government. That's excellent, but we will need the policies to make sure that that works. So we've got to go on, Maggie. I know that there are here some people who were present at the parliamentary lobby 10 days ago in Westminster. A great occasion, 16,000 people registered and turned up, many more there besides. It was a very good, healthy, productive, um, the atmosphere was great. We lined the banks of the Thames between Westminster Bridge and Lambeth Bridge on both sides of the Thames, posters with the constituencies and I don't know how many uh, MPs came out to speak to their constituents. It was a great day. Did the media take any notice at all? Yeah. Nowhere on the BBC or ITV was there any mention. And yet, I've never known that many parliamentarians coming out to speak to their constituents about a single policy. So we've got to make sure that we're making a noise. And these things are so important. It's, it's the governments, yes, they've got to do something, and we've got to make sure that industry is doing things too. And surprisingly, they're coming up with some good ideas, ways of trapping CO2 immersed. We're listening to a rather alarming program the other day that some CO2 can be trapped uh, from animal waste in order to become the bubbles in our fizzy drinks. I think I'm changing my drinking habits. <laughs> but industry will play a part, and, and that's important too, of course it is. But then it comes down to you and to me and to every individual. We have got to make sure we're doing something. It can't be, as Paul repeated several times in his talk, it can't be out there people doing things. We've got to change. I want to suggest to you just two or three scripture passages which I found important in reminding me about who I am and what is expected of me. I don't know about you, but uh, scripture is quite, it's a dodgy business. You can have these familiar passages that you've read hundreds of times and then suddenly, one day, one of them says something quite new and comes, stands out, really quite frightening. I don't know how many times I must have read in John's Gospel, one of the most popular passages, and then only about three years ago, I thought, are you real? I have not seen you before. A simple phrase, remain in my love. And it just dawned on me that we can't remain in God's love unless we're already there. Which actually begins to challenge me for my whole life, I think, that assumption that I have to earn God's love. That if I did something wrong, God would stop loving me. This came from my primary school days. I'm going to take off on a tangent now, but it may, it may help us to understand. I was taught by some wonderful nuns. They were completely batty, but they were lovely. <laughs> they were so eccentric in so many ways, but I learned so much from them. And in our school, 
Every form was divided into four teams. There was the yellows, the greens, and the blues, and the reds. And each of those teams had a patron. The yellows, that was my team, St. Joseph. The reds were the Sacred Heart. The blues were Our Lady. And the greens, rather predictably, St. Patrick, uh, which accounted for all the nuns in the <laughs> convent. Um, and Sister Scholastica, wonderful lady that she was, had prep two. And in prep two, the classroom, she had four enormous banners of those colours. And on each of those banners, she had the smiling face of the patron. And she would be conducting her classes, and she would suddenly say, John Arnold, you're not paying attention, are you? You're talking again to Mark. Next would stop her. What team are you in? The others. St. Joseph wouldn't be wanting to smile down on you, no? would you turn the face to the wall. I was mortified. St. Joseph had stopped loving me. God had stopped loving me. Cruel, really. But, no, to her credit, there was never the end of the day when all those four patrons weren't smiling down on us. And we could go home and she would always be full of congratulations for everything we'd achieved during the day. But it left that lingering feeling. That I had to earn God's love and he'd stop loving me if I got things wrong. But I think that we need to remind ourselves that God loves us unconditionally all the time. He doesn't walk away from us, he doesn't give up on us. When we get things wrong, well I'm sure he's a bit disappointed but he's ready to forgive and he gives us that wonderful opportunity to learn from our mistakes. If we can get that solidly in our heads, we have got a real sense of self-worth, of dignity. God is with us. He hasn't left us. He hasn't said, oh, you're making a mess of the earth. Well, I'm not bothered with you lot. You're in for self-destruction. I'm going. He's there. His plan is for us. And he's not going to leave us alone. So we've got a sure anchor there. That's a really good starting place. But then I want to go on to another phrase. Well, I can tell you exactly when I saw this. It was Shrove Tuesday, 2007. I was going to do Ash Wednesday services the next day, so I was preparing my homily. I got three services, and they were in different places, and I thought, this is going to be really tricky, talking to school children in one place, um, uh, in a care home for another mass, and then I was uh, with some businessmen in the city of London for the third one. I thought, what am I going to say? So I read the first reading, and it was from the Old Testament, and I'm in a bit of trouble with some of the images in that, in vengeful God and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I went to the second reading from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the second letter. And I read it, and I thought, oh, that's, yeah, that's good stuff, I'll get something. Oh, what's that? I haven't seen that before. Well, I have to. I haven't seen it every Ash Wednesday throughout my life and other occasions as well, but I haven't seen it. A simple phrase. So, we are ambassadors for Christ. And I thought, now I haven't seen you before. Let's think about this one. What's an ambassador? An ambassador is someone who's delegated by somebody else to stand in their place, to carry on their work with their authority. And you and I, whoever we are, whatever stage of life we're at, we are delegated by Jesus Christ to stand in his place, to carry on his work with his authority. What a challenge, what a privilege. But that's us, that's who we are, 100%. It's not just when we get to church on Sunday or when we're saying nice things or saying our prayers at the end of the day. No, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we are ambassadors for Christ. And that's got to be what we are every day. And reminding ourselves that we are ambassadors for Christ. I have to say that that struck me so powerfully then that I can't get it out of my head and I'm constantly repeating it. I'm sure there are lots of people in my diocese who are thinking, for God's sake, can we not preach about something else? <laughs> but it is so important. God loves me, 
He's made me his son's ambassador. I've got my work to do. And it's real and it's current and it's not earned, it's gift. That's the way forward. And then there's a third thing which only came to me quite recently, I suppose, um, but struck me as being really quite powerful in the way I should be praying. And it comes from Mark's Gospel. Mark is my favourite Gospel for reasons I oh, can't go into now. But at the beginning of chapter 2, it says, When Jesus returned to Capernaum some days later, word went round that he was back. And so many people gathered that there was no room even in front of the door. Jesus was teaching the word to them when some people came, bringing a paralytic carried by four men. But as the crowds made it impossible to bring the man to Jesus, they stripped the roof above the place where Jesus was, and when they made an opening, they lowered the stretcher on which the paralytic lay. Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, my child, your sins are forgiven. A little bit after that, he also tells the guy to get up and go home, take up his stretcher and go home. But that is a magnificent text. Who were those for? What were their motives? Did the guy on the stretcher actually know them? Did he say, will you take me to Jesus? Or did they say, Jesus is down there, let's get this guy into him. But the effect is magnificent. Without the paralytic being able to do anything for himself, four people of faith, who will never know who they were, brought the man to Jesus so that Jesus could do what he required to do. That's magnificent. What does that say to me about the way I pray for other people? How I include issues in my prayer? I can bring someone who probably doesn't even believe in Jesus, and I can put him right there in front of Jesus and say to Jesus, get on with it, you know what you need to do. It's a very powerful position to be in. Those four anonymous stretcher bearers achieved a great deal, and they set up a whole dimension for us in our prayer to bring people to Jesus so that Jesus can do what is required for them, even if we can't. I think we've got great possibilities in prayer. That was the final point that Paul made. Yes, we can, we can make our changes. We can eat less meat. We can think more carefully about where we travel. We can certainly buy less clothes. Do you know that clothes are the second biggest pollutant after the burning of fossil fuels? There's that, uh, oh, uh, Stacey Dooley. You don't know, do you, you know the name? Stacey Dooley, a young lady, I think she one Strictly Come Dancing, but I wouldn't be sure because I've never watched it and I don't want to. But she is really quite something. And she made a program about, uh, it was a um, no fashion, dirty tricks or something. Yep, can't remember the time. But she starts off by saying, I just love clothes. When I have a day off, I go into the shops and I buy up all this stuff and I go home and I take photographs and I can put them on social media so all my friends can see them. I love clothes. And someone challenged her as to where these clothes came from and what happened and the pollutants that were used and the chemicals and how it was wrecking people's lives uh, by polluting their water sources. How the Aral Sea in Uzbekistan, one of the biggest inland water masses in the world 40 years ago, has lost 80% of its volume. The size of Ireland in 40 years to an arid desert. Appalling. Because of the needs in the manufacture of clothes. And that's you and that's me. I am now, having watched that, I have not bought a single piece of clothing that I don't intend to for a long time. It was really frightening. And she went to Indonesia, and she was at a river where there were factories all around producing clothes for us here in the West, all the big names like uh, Primark and all the rest of them. Uh, and this river was supplying the water for 28 million people 
and they can't drink it. And there was one particular lovely lady, she was standing with a tiny little baby in her arms, and Stacy Dooley was saying, um, you look as though you've got some terrible rashes on you. And um, she said, yes, it's, it's from the water, washing the water from the river, and it's terrible. And she said, your baby doesn't have any rashes. She said, no, no, we, we spend our savings buying a gallon of water to wash the children once a week in clean water. It was heartrending. Uh, so we've, we've got to be so clear about the things that we can do, even the small gestures. But we've also got to recognise that God's in this with us, and we're not alone, and we can change things, and as Pope Francis says, we must never give up on that accent of hope in who we are, what we're about, with God's plan. And I'd just like to take a moment to, if, if I may, on the disciples. The disciple, and this is why Mark's Gospel is so important to me. If you read Mark's Gospel with the accent on looking at the disciples and their behaviour, they're at best disappointing, at worst they're rubbish. They really are. And I was so pleased. A, a few months ago, I read a book by uh, Rowan Williams, Emeritus Archbishop of Canterbury, his book on Mark. And there's a phrase in there that he says the disciples are, quote, conspicuously stupid. <laughs> I felt my opinion was endorsed at last. But I, I find great strength, actually, in sitting with the disciples at various stages of Christ's ministry and trying to be there and trying to understand things as they were happening. And I'd like you to be with me for a moment on that day of the Ascension. We're with the disciples. What have we been through? We've been through the absolute trauma of Good Friday, when we thought, after the crucifixion, that everything was over. Everything we thought was going to happen can't happen now. He's dead. We just put him in the tomb. And who was he anyway? If he was the Messiah, how could they have killed him? And if he wasn't the Messiah, was he just lying to us? We're so confused. What, what's going on? It's just an appalling panic. And there must have been terrible repercussions among the disciples in that next 48 hours. Peter, you're supposed to be in the leader. You denied it. Judas, what happened there? He was a member of our community. He got so depressed, he went off and betrayed Jesus. We should have done something just to know how he was feeling, what was going wrong in his life. We failed miserably. And James and John, they'd have been bickering at people. They had a, what were they called? I've forgotten now. Sons of Thunder, thank you very much. Uh, they, they weren't into polite conversations too much. That Holy Saturday must have been dreadful. And then you come to Easter Sunday, and all the shock goes into reverse because he suddenly comes in and he says, Please be with you. He's back. We can touch him, we can, we can see him, we can hear his voice. We're going to take time to get used to this, but it's real. It's happened. He's here. And Thomas comes in wonderfully and reinforces it by doubting everything. I love Thomas, he's great because he gets us the reassurance that we need. And what would the disciples have been thinking about over the next 40 days or so? We're the disciples. We didn't do too well before, did we? Because he did tell us three times about what was going to happen to us. We weren't listening. And uh, we'll be listening rather better this time. But he's back. The great thing is, he's here. He's our teacher. He's our leader. He's our guide. He's the decision maker. We are going to be great now as his team of disciples. We will follow him. And then we get to that day, and suddenly he says, well, I'm going now. I'm going back to the Father. Oh, and by the way, here's the mission. Go out to the whole world, proclaim the good news, and baptize. And they must have thought, come on, get real, Jesus. That's not going to happen, is it? I mean, let's be reasonable about this. There's 11 of us now. We weren't much good as disciples, and you're just asking us to be evangelizers? 
For the most part, we're illiterate fishermen. We've never been more than 30, 40 miles from our home in the last three years, wandering around with you. And you're telling us to go out to a whole world. We speak Aramaic, they speak Greek and Latin. It's just not going to happen. And Jesus says, but I'll give you the advocate. who will remind you of everything I said to you and lead you in all truth. They must have thought, well, who is this then? Have we met him? Sounds a bit like a lawyer. Is he going to give us a handbook as to how to do this? We're no good, we can't read it, we're illiterate anyway. They must have been in total confusion and overwhelmed, and he'd gone. Couldn't ask him any more questions. They've got to wait. And they wait for Pentecost. And it happens. Absurdly, those 11 illiterates who got it all wrong during the ministry, well, not all wrong, but they made quite a mess of it, if you read Mark's Gospel. Suddenly, they're there. One step after another, with the grace and the strength of the Holy Spirit, they actually begin to do what Jesus asked them to do. What was completely right, yes, it's going to be hard work. And some of them are going to be persecuted along the way. They're going to find people in opposition to them. They're going to have a long time on the road trying to persuade people. And it's not all going to go their way at all. But the plan is working. Now, that's important to me because it looks to me, after Paul's erudite explanation as to the fix we're in, that it looks almost impossible as the disciples must have felt on that evening of the ascension. But are we going to be faithful? Are we going to rely on the presence of God who loves us? On the presence of the Spirit who will guide us step by step? And are we determined to make that difference that God is giving us to make as missionary disciples? I believe we can do this. I've seen it in the young people becoming alive and alert to everything that they can do. I can see the urgency beginning to impinge on a lot more people. I'm appalled by President Trump and people like him who will not give it a moment's consideration. But I think it will come back and bite them rather hard. But I believe that we can do this, and I believe that God's plan is still there, and he loves us. We remain in his love. And for that reason, I can only be optimistic. Despite all the statistics around us, uh, I think, I'm sure, we can succeed. Now in my diocese, there's a little prayer. It's only seven words, so it doesn't take much memorizing. But I think it's working. It's certainly working a great deal through our consultation, our change, our restructuring, and all the rest of it. Quite simply this. Stay with us, Lord, on our journey. But if the Lord stays with us on our journey because we pester him to do so, then we know we're travelling in the right direction, at roughly the right speed, and that we, we know that we're not on our own. That's essential. We become, I think, quite arrogant in our consumerism. How was it that for 200 years of industrialization, we didn't stop and think about the damage we were doing to this planet? Was it just greed? Was it just turning a blind eye? But for at least the last 30 years, we come to a much clearer understanding. It's not been said loudly enough, but we now know what we've got to do. And I believe that with God's grace, we will do exactly what he wants us to do, and we will be missionary disciples in the world in which we live. Thank you.